talking about earlier as well, which I is... Mean, I think I think in this building we're all happy to support public assets, but if, if there were also, let's say, money that wound its way into broadband investments or something like that, that seems relevant and might might get more people interested. So, so I don't I, I don't know if right. you thought about that. But. No, we did. We thought about it a lot this summer, and we just knew that we only had a certain number of meetings to address it, and we felt like we were sort of getting pulled in a lot of di different directions, so we kept coming back to the original charge, which was looking at this, but it certainly was brought up by numerous witnesses that it's, it could be much larger, and but I see your point in terms of getting more eyes on it. And, from what I understand, there is another study out there that this could get folded into. But in uh, House IT? I don't know. James said something about there is a telecom bill or a telecom study out there. There's a telecom plan. Okay. Uh, which the Department of Public Service, Maria Royal, yeah. by the City Council, they asked for last year you made a number of revisions yeah. to the telecom plan and what the requirements are. And you specify that the next plan is due December 1st of this year. Yeah. I think there was discussion with the commission about whether they had the time or resources to complete the plan by that date. That's right. Uh, and you, in Act 79, said if you feel like you don't have time or resources, you can come back with a proposal for retaining an outside consultant. As part of the governor's recommend in the big bill, uh, they are asking for $300,000 to hire an outside vendor to do the telecom plan. As part of your revisions to the requirements of the telecom plan that you made last year, there is a section that says to look at um, specifically the AMLs, access media organizations. Okay. Um, and so look at the line so that that would that would that But I be. made that my Senator Kitchell is referring to. I think to it probably is. As part of yeah. that. Okay. So I think we'll send this over and. Okay. They'll look at their money and do what they're going to do with it. But there is a bigger look see in the work. Okay. And did you, sorry, just for clarification, Senator Pearson raised, do you want this to look at potentially, you know, these are different financing options that might potentially fund other public I mean, programs? I mean, if, kind it, of a big if picture? it is a source of revenue that, you know, could be an answer to the public access question, but also could provide 10 times that revenue. You know, it, it seems to me we would want to understand that, and, and, but I, I don't have more specifics than that. Uh, I mean, you're not precluded from that. But, no, no. But I wonder if it's worth mentioning. I have a feeling the other plan may take that up, too. There's not more time to take that so just not to beat a dead horse, but do you have a... Well, I, I, I guess I offer it to you as a suggestion yeah. if you want to run with it. Yeah. I think Go that would probably keep it in here. If we do a major, you know, change, we'll have to take right. a testimony. Yeah. Well, I, and I, most, I just I mean, it's the it same. Out. That's fine. Yeah. It's it's the same principle. It's just it's just sort of a mention that okay. it's not just a way to fund PEG. It's... It's a, you know, we need to understand this, this source of revenue. If there, are, if there are all these people who are hanging yeah. in the right of way that are getting a freebie right now, I don't know what that means. I mean, the yes. study will look at ways to fund PEG and potentially other public services. Yeah, I think it's yep. okay. fun. So we're going to go do that real quick. Okay. All right. All right. Then we're going to go on to committee discussion and possible market items. Um, committee 267. And yes, Green Warren Coleman Green Empower just sent a, a, a summary sheet for you all to look at. Okay. And that you may want to start with. I can print it right. out if you want. That would be great if you can print it out. Okay. I'd like to have a earlier. This doesn't even go in there. This is unfunded budget questions. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody had one or two slight issues, but they gave us 10 sheets of paper. 
and I would like to get down to a one sentence from everybody. This is what it will cost us. This is what it will allow. This will just so apparently, at least we're not power in Belco. I don't know who all else. Warren and Green Hat Power. And we're ahead, but um, VEPSA also has a thing on their concern about hydro and what they want to have in it. And I understand the issues with Tier 3 and the rules. So this has gone through rules. What are we doing? Well, that's tier three. Yes. Yeah. So the, the rule is the rule is being proposed that uses the same definition <laughs> tier three as a tier three. And okay. And Elkhart is Elkhart is tier three. So I get, we conceptually put together just a, a one page or double sided that this, the other side has some ideas on the tier two proposal, but on the front side is just um, to try to kind of sum up both from a cost perspective, um, impact perspective, the things we're thinking about with respect to tier one and tier two. And I mean, to quickly step through, just hit again, in terms of carbon and greenhouse gas, I think everybody knows, but the, again, the biggest contributors in Vermont, transportation, thermal, so as we think about that, being very careful not to drive up the price of electricity at the same time we're trying to electrify more uh, to decarbonize the system. Tier one, uh, I don't think we got we got into this a lot last time we were here, but again, just from our perspective, maintaining that flexibility, one of the largest providers is HQ, which is the New England area of existing renewable uh, into Vermont, and taking um, such a large resource out of the mix. The concern is that the message it also sends to other providers in the region in terms of cost, and you know you take out one of the major suppliers there, and you're, you give the risk of driving up costs from the other suppliers that exist. There's a finite amount of this resource. Also, if you can't buy it, we're limiting competition. So what what's left is more valuable. That's exactly right. And it's not even that we we necessarily look to do more with HQ or anything. It's just having that player still in the mix is important from a um, you know putting them on it could get an advantage. Okay. There would be more hydro available to others if we don't buy it. Why would that drive the price up? What, well, what I'm saying is we would drive it up for, so if other suppliers of the tier one oh, resource. Other components, okay. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. They would see, like, okay, oh, it skews out of the mix. I can, you know, it just changes that. They have to meet the 100% quota, yeah. so that gives. That's right. Leverage. Leverage. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Can I ask Josh a question? Sure. It, it, it is helpful to have you step us through the different components. Sure. And I'll be the first to confess, you know, we drafted this wanting to better understand each of the components. Yep. Um, you, right now, you can buy Rex from HQ and you buy Power from HQ, but they're not linked together, right? Uh, so some are, and you can sell. So we, we have energy contracts with HQ that includes the attribute, and then separately we have some attribute only. So the energy is being delivered to New England, 
and we're taking the, the rack essentially from, from that. And Doug, feel free to chime in if I no, that's about it. Is anything there? Um, so, but you get more recs than power. That is correct. Total. At Current present. Yeah. Yes, sir. That ends pretty soon, but that's correct. Okay. And 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 no other states use HQ power. Is that true? In New England. They, um, in short, Massachusetts is the biggest example, and, and in two ways, um, they are, I would say, planning, since both of these are in the works. One, a proposed new transmission line to meet their so-called CES, or clean energy standard requirements. I don't think that is technically their renewable portfolio standard, but that will be something like, I don't remember the exact number, but seven or eight million megawatt hours if that project is constructed uh, primarily large hydroelectric from Quebec. The other initiative of Massachusetts is so-called CESE, Clean Energy Standard Existing. That's only a rulemaking right now. But um, as um, uh, outlined, that would make use of hydroelectric uh, energy imported over the existing <laughs> transmission tie uh, known as uh, HVDC Phase 2. And does anyone else permit RECs from HQ in New England? I think the CESE is the first. Is that right, Doug? In terms of using uh, I'm not. I'm not aware uh, of another state that, that counts uh, that energy toward its so-called renewable requirements, like a renewable portfolio standard or RPS. But to meet carbon goals, that's what the, the CES, or Clean Energy Standard, does. So um, they, I guess, wouldn't say ducked, but effectively, it doesn't. It, it, they don't exactly label it as renewable, but they, Massachusetts surely will be counting for clean energy goals. I'm okay. not aware of other states at this time. I don't know. Do other states? Because I know Hydro's been trying to get a, a line down to. Boston and other states. Do other states have as large a percentage in their portfolio of hydro as we do? Are they, are they using? Do we know? I mean, hydro runs through here trying to get there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I don't okay. know that. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't. All right. Okay, so. We like a hundred percent, but you'd like to be able to keep using hydro because <clears throat> it gives you a little bargaining power. Not one minute. That's right. All right. <clears throat> um, so over to tier two. So one, thinking about the, you know, Senator Pearson's point about it's twenty percent, you know, the eight percent, and thinking in terms of as. It has essentially been a um, mostly PV. It's currently still mostly solar in terms of tier two. So 20% doubling it to achieve that under the way it's defined today would essentially be more than be more than 1,200 megawatts of solar in Vermont. Both the stuff that's used to meet tier two as well as older stuff that doesn't even count to tier two. But all of that combined gives you over 1,200 megawatts of PV that would be in Vermont in a state that has a current peak demand of around 900 or so. So just to put in perspective why now that then feeds into some of these costs I'll talk about, but the trans transmission being a really big one, um, mm -hmm. it's just a lot of one resource stacked up on top of itself, um, which is where a lot of the challenges come in. So GMP, we talked about as we step through the bullets here, we're looking at a snapshot of because the other thing is just looking at a single rate increase number isn't also a great look because what happens is you have a rate increase, but then that's customers are paying that for yeah. ever or exact. So and looking at a 10 year snapshot, for example, um, you know, the, the, the 15 to 25 million obviously is 150 to 250 million to to get that additional 10% of tier two with the 250 million being on the high end if it were more expensive resources, the 50 obviously on the lower end with some flexibility there. And then we step to um, the transmission infrastructure, the point that Velco made about as you start to hit more congestion of the system, it's going to take improvements to unlock the system. 
And that's a pretty big range, but for GMPs, how that actually flows to GMPs customers, and ultimately this would flow to other DU's customers, distribution utility customers, oh, yeah, the same way, but less based on their they, share. They do less of that. It would probably be the same. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's all relative. Basically, you know, your the, the little table is a snapshot here. Um, Velco had looked at sort of three scenarios: so low, medium, high, low being you know really well cited, and, and Velco can step through with more detail what those scenarios are. But 150 to 500 million of transmission investment, and what that results in is this line below, where basically it's it's an additional 15 to 50 million per year to the GMP per customers. Year. Yeah, yeah, it's an annual. Because what happens, well, it would unlike- be every year, but it wouldn't be, would it be the be, same charge every year? Yes. It wouldn't be on top of. So it'd be 50 million one year and another 50 the second That's year. That's right. So it'd just be a $50 million yeah. dollar charge. Exactly. But it would go on for multiple years. That's right. So it's not a one-time, right. that's the point. But it's, it doesn't go 50, then 100, then 150. It's 50 million of additional cost um, for the duration, essentially. For when, I assume if we're paying it off, maybe 20 years? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, the asset's there. probably 30 to 40. It doesn't appreciate, so that number over time will start to go down a little okay. bit. Okay. But the first 10 years, it's basically about that, that amount per year. Okay. And you mentioned the that part of the cause of this was transmission. That's correct. And so when you were computing these numbers, were you assuming that the distribution was random or um, or in areas that are already have sufficient so, distribution? Yeah, so, that's a really good question. So Velco, the, the 150, 300, 500 million, Velco did three scenarios. and. They'll be better to speak to it, but at a high level, the, the low scenario was was better distribution, you know, more optimal sited. And the 500 is if it wasn't as optimally sited, and that, that kind of gets you some of that range there. So you can reduce the cost if it's sited well, but you still have a chunk of cost at, at some point. And I do, I mean, I, I do go back to the point though that even, even there we had, and the state with a 900 megawatt peak to have over 1,200 megawatts of one resource still. Right? So it's a, I guess the question that I'm sure because distribution costs, uh, upgraded costs for distributing electricity are about three percent for month and 97 percent. New England pool funded when you're distributing it. Oh, right here. So you're talking if, if you do a transmission project that's shared by New England? Yeah, yeah Vermont gets a 4% share of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Yes, sir. So, yeah, but if you were making power in a place that um, has to, where we are obliged to get it out of that place, well, that's 100% of Vermont. So when I, I'm trying to understand when you say transmission costs are whatever, yeah. are you if we're only considering these renewables in the area where the transmission costs are 3%, it's wildly different than if we're considering locating them where it's 100% to get it out. Yeah, so so this assumes that, that these costs are 100% are borne by Vermont. Because if it's if the transmission projects are being driven by generation or too much generation, Vermont has to pay for that versus if it's load growth and reliability is related. Um, and I don't and care it's here. I mean, you'll be able to speak to that. So, so, I'm not sure. so if we assume that we're authorizing uh, more renewables and they're all going to be in the areas that are cost us 100% to, to market, mm -hmm. um, what if in the process of putting together uh, a tier two, it was stated that they would be located in places where it only the most would cost three percent to get it to market and those numbers change yeah although i think again it's so the anywhere the vermont system anywhere it's going to be the hundred percent the the four percent really only pertains when the the need for the transmission isn't generation constraint issues it's that's when there's a reliability system upgrade there's a so if it's related to generation 
it's the hundred percent regardless of where where it's located. And reliability, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm just rocking. Assuming. Some of us might remember when the lights went out. So, but reliability is there to, with ISO to make to make sure that there is enough electricity and enough transmission, transmission capacity and enough backup transmission capacity so that the lights don't go out in all of, well, I think it was New York North, they yeah. went out the first time. Yeah. And so if the transmission is necessary to make sure that we have those backup systems and that there is enough energy available, then we all share in the cost because we all benefit. So if we needed to get Vermont solar to New York City or to Boston in time of a storm that shut them down or you know whatever that might come in under but that is an ISO New England right project and call anything we decide to build on our own to move our electricity around our state is ours. Is that? I mean, that's a fair assumption. I'll yeah. Yeah. Now for the All right. Unless we there are might, places that are right. currently adequate. Right. So we might. All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You want to care? Do you have? Yes, you know the machine. I, I know that, uh, uh, for the record, my name is Carrick Johnson. I work for Vermont Power Company. Velcro, just a few things. One, as Josh indicated, you know, in Vermont, we built about a billion dollars worth of transmission say, over the last 12 years. Uh, over a four-year period, that was concentrated. The region itself has built about $8 billion worth of transmission. Out of those total costs, Vermont pays about a little less than 4% of those. It was all for system reliability. The philosophy being we have a we have a shared million. purpose. Run it. Yes. It was forty million? I'm sorry for Vermonters. Was the cost? Excuse me. Um, overall, over the ten years, it would be four percent. You roughly speak. Yes. Four percent. There's a lot of carrying costs in forty million. Yeah. Um, so, wait a minute, Senator Pearson. I just want to be sure. Of a billion, it was more than forty million to be paid. It was four percent of four billion. Yeah. But not all the construction was in Vermont. Of a billion, there was a billion dollars worth of construction that indeed was in Vermont, eight billion region wide. Yeah. Secondly, in terms of Josh has it right, if it's not interconnected, if it's not driven by reliability concerns, and reliability concerns largely driven by load growth, peak load growth, and as you know, Vermont's load has been dropping. So thus, actually, for the latest 20 year plan we did, which is what we shared with you, uh, Hans, President May shared last week, mm -hmm. there were no reliability investments on the horizon. The scenarios we put together and shared with the distribution utilities largely hinged if there's two major factors that impacted the high, medium, and low scenarios were two fundamental things. One, the greater the control over where additional generation is cited, the lower the cost. And the, and the, and the less the use of batteries, we tried to incorporate some cost, um, based on some hallway conversations after that, we tried to incorporate some some modicum of lowering costs for storage. It's all, it's all assumptions. Mm -hmm. But to a degree, you count less on storage, so we're building more wires as opposed to fewer wires, so we're not pursuing non-transitional alternatives, <coughs> which we're required to do. Putting that aside, that helps drive. So how much control you have over where the generation goes and how much you're depending upon storage are the two major factors that determine what is the ultimate price tag. So that's how we got the high, medium, and low scenarios. Okay. So if we had the power to say it would all go next to our three largest consumer areas, then we would probably be on the low end of that or even maybe a little below it. Madam Chair, the way I've characterized it is this. If you put the generation closest to where the system is the most robust from a transmission system perspective, where do we have good pipes that can absorb the energy in. that's coming in? Well, that would, which is, if you recall, Madam Chair, that's I why do. Hans was talking about Southern Vermont. That's where that would be good. Because okay. there is a whole lot of transmission lines that were set there for Vermont Yankees. 
right. And, um, but just to come back to your overall point, because these numbers are big and scary. Mm -hmm. Vermonters in the last 10 years have had to invest $80 million for the transmission upgrades of the region. I think it was a, a longer time frame. I, I want to say it was like from 2000, uh, 1998 over to 2006. Budget. So we, those costs have been absorbed and been paid uh, over, over the course of time. Sure. It was, it was, go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Could I ask Josh, the, can we assume that for current law, we would just cut these numbers in half, or, or how, how do we handle it? No one has approached any of us, to my knowledge, asking for changes to current law. I assume there's not, no, no cost implications to the current REM. Yeah, so you mean under the existing 10% tier two? Do we just cut these estimates in half, or what? Probably, that's probably reasonable, I think. Um, yeah, assuming you continue with it, with a spread of distribution of, of solar and, and that sort of thing for the existing 10%. Well, order of magnitude is probably reasonable. Okay. And that's, I should, one of the things too, I, I, I mentioned last time, and we did attempt to bake in a little bit to the additional cost is that underneath the transmission system is the distribution system, which also has its own limitations. We've attempted in, in our you know, total number here to capture some of that as well, but it is another sort of layer that's down <laughs> as well. And could I ask one other question? You guys have gotten approval to install storage, as I understand it, without impacting rates. Has that been the deal with the PUC? Yeah, the, well, the storage we've done has been designed, developed to produce a, a benefit to our, our customers over its life. And so, so just to, to summarize, yep. that, that is a way of saying you've been able to figure out how to invest in storage without having a rate impact for customers. The, it, yeah, and I should be clear, there can be an initial rate impact and then a rate benefit, but the net of it is a benefit, if that makes sense. But the reason except for Ed is shaking his head no. <laughs> um, sorry, Ed McNamara from the Department of Public Service. I just wanted to clarify one thing. I agree with everything. The reason I'm shaking my head no is that GMP is currently using the uh, Tesla power walls and other storage devices to reduce peak, not yes, to yes, yes. generation, which is an important consideration. So, yeah, Mr. McNamara, the, the other place it's going is the reason we're able to do that is because we're able to use the storage specifically for those power market benefits, the capacity market, lower our peaks. In some cases, do a service called regulation, which basically the ISO pays us to have resources. If you have to shift to essentially be soaking up solar all the time, you're gonna, you're gonna give up some of that, that value. So the, the equation will change if you're doing battery storage just for the purpose of making sure you can manage the transmission system. That, that's the only other point I want to make here. And, and so how do we factor in the storage investments that, you know, I, I guess I'm hearing you say there's a limit to how much we can assure ratepayers that storage won't impact rates based on what you're telling me. And, and how is that limit like, is that, if we're talking about 20% of the load, does that limit top out at 2% or 8% or 12%? Do you, do you, do you, is there a way for, for us to understand that? It's tough. You, you, one, of the, one of the key drivers of the benefits of storage is that peak, as we said. And there's only so much peak before it becomes flat in a sense where you're not getting any more benefit. Problem to have, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, the, the amount of storage that you're talking about to achieve, you know, soaking up this, I think is still so considerable. I think when Velco did a, a snapshot of, hey, if we just use storage, it'd be a $900 million cost. Obviously, you probably wouldn't just do storage, you do a mix of things. And some of that storage, you hope to get some of those benefits, but I think it's still, the size we're talking about still dwarfs the value we could get in those, in those peaks, uh, just because there's a finite amount. And, and do we have a sense of, what your current strategy storage budget is? Is it, is it 12 million? Is it, you know, 
over this similar timeline? Um, yeah, I would say if, I mean, we're working on, on a couple things around storage, doing storage in homes and in the grid, but it's probably in the, in the five to 10 million range over the next three, yeah, three to four years. Senator Pearson, uh, this is Kirk Johnson again from Falco. I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I just need, okay. to, need to stress that going after peak right now is, is itself a moving target. And every New England state has identified that's a cost we want to drive down. Our impact in, in investing millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars, certainly in the case of Massachusetts, where they have defined programs and subsidies going after Massachusetts, which is 80% of New England's load, trying to drive down and address their peak. So the, the, the race is on. We're trying to do it. And so you're asking, okay, how about this assumption? Might we do that even as the other uh, contestants in the race are doing what they can to affect peak? So I'm just wondering, sure, that's good. There's an impossible, infinite amount of variables, <laughs> and, and, yes. and you know, I'm going to just try to put them all yep. together to the extent we can. And the reason we want to drive down peak is because that's when we turn on the really dirty or really expensive stuff. Sure. So we got, I think we've got this little, get. we used to have this little thing up in Burlington that we'd only turn on <laughs> when it was really bad. Yeah. But um, it, yeah, again, lastly, sorry, the only other thing that you need to be aware of, your percentage of use, Vermont's percentage of use at peak drives a whole host of costs to run the system. If you're 4% at peak, okay, we're going to charge you 4% for all these categories of costs to run the system. If you're 2%, well, then you'll have to pay 2% of the total cost to run the system. We don't charge. Okay. Exactly. So in addition to dirty power on that one-off use, it sets the framework and the yeah. cost for a okay. bunch of other costs. So if that's so if the more we get the peak under control, the lower our overall costs are for power. Yeah. Yeah. Cost and carbon at the peak, but you can hit it right on lower right. Right. So there's still room to produce the peak. Okay. There is. Yeah. There's still some room there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so the, uh, the middle. Yes, you give us did if we would really pay close attention to where we located. Uh, um, right. and, it, and those numbers are uh, to shrink <coughs> and distribute any new power renewables required in an intelligent and thoughtful manner in the proper places. Yeah, are you you're saying like the, the middle scenario if you cite it better? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that's fair. The better you cite it, the more you know. The more south you push it, where there's stronger transmission, that leads to other questions about land and availability to do it. But yeah, the right. cost of the land, and let us not forget the neighbors uh, who can neighbors. wealthier neighborhoods and wealth tend to have the resources to fight harder um, if we're going to block their views. And the reason it's just cheaper to do it in poorer, smaller, more rural communities. Well, that's on the developer because they deliver, yeah. the, they deliver the price on bid. And that's what we pay. It costs the developer more to hassle with their papers. That's on them and it's not a public expense. Yeah, but they'll figure it into their costs. In, in, yeah. But we take the lowest average. Yeah. So. My husband used to call the POA. I'm <laughs> sure we'll recall when, when you reported the, uh, the bill on the Vermont Yankee upgrade and whether or not we should participate, that we were given a bunch of expenses of, of, and <laughs> benefits of how much the 20% increase of power was. And we were shocked a couple of years later to find out that because we'd increased the, the power output down there 20 years later, we had we had been all subject to the increased um, expenses for accounting for that 20% increase for all the lines that had to be rebuilt and restructured following the upgrade. But when this committee and, and members of, of this legislature tried to analyze those costs, those were never part of the discussion. It was only the benefits and the costs were not, um, were, were, came to us much later of how come no one told us that? So perhaps we should give some kudos here for mm -hmm. covering this end of it so we can 
we understand a more, a more I, I think we may also have overestimated the ability of the local economy to handle a shutdown. And that was something that yes. we did not give, I think, due deference to. And Brattleboro is not a thriving community at the moment, mm -hmm. or as thriving That's as it was. separate and distinct. Yes, but it was brought up here, and we didn't focus. Okay, I think you have a solution on the back. Well, hold on. There's one really. One more? I can't wait for you to get to this last point. What's the next one? Interesting. Which one do you want to hit? Well, you've, yeah. you've been coming right down the line. But. Yeah. <laughs> so to speak. So, is that meter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's basically, we put some of the, PUC had recently done a, a request for information through a process, so this, this information is straight out of there, which is basically just the, um, just highlighting over 10 years, what, what's the above market cost of, of that metering program as we look ahead. So all we're, we're highlighting there, that's, that's happening. So there's nothing, you know, and, and that'll go through its own process. Um, but it's just to point out there's some other cost drivers that are existing that this is an addition to the you know, sort of the point there. Okay. The, the reason that it intrigues me is, so a couple questions. There's a, a net metering process mm -hmm. for the ongoing review. Yep. And so does this assume we just stick where we are? or that that process sort of doesn't work to your advantage in any way? It sort of, it, it assumes that um, there is a slight decline in the rate and there's a slight increase in retail rates that make, because <coughs> basically you're offsetting the retail rate. So if the retail electric rate is, is going up, that's becoming more valuable. And at the same time, the um, incentive rate might go down. So it sort of balances out a little bit, but um, it doesn't take like a drastic cut. In net metering, for sure. But all of this net metering qualifies for tier two. That's correct. So, have you backed this? Uh, how, how are you merging your two scenarios here? Like we're, this, this is purely. I, we almost look at the uh, initial tier two, ten percent. It's just separate, and and this is part of it for sure. This net metering is part of the initial tier two, but I'm not trying to merge those. The other costs we're showing here are sort of this, if we did the second piece as proposed of tier two, just the second 10%. If yeah. the, four, the 400 is what would be added on if we did the, the additional 10%. No, sorry, no, the this, is what it's, this is what it's going to cost under the present <laughs> scenario. So if we add any more on top of it, and the same percentage of net metering shows up. You could, if we double the requirement and the same <coughs> mix comes in, we could assume that that would be an additional 400. You could, we, so we attempted to capture up above where we have the 150 to 250. Yeah. That is, that is our attempt to show what the next 10% would cost. Because we look at net okay. metering sort of like, it's gonna do its thing on its own, depending on the incentive rates and a lot of different things there. And whatever it is, it's going to count towards Tier 2. But it's most likely going to cover the first 10% of, of Tier 2, which is already happening. Right. And so then we look at, okay, the next 10% will be met with other resources. Maybe a little bit of net metering in there as well, but likely other PPAs, standard offer, those types of things. This 400 is just highlighting the existing net metering that's going to continue um, today, basically. Okay. It's context, as I think your questions are getting to. It is a, we're looking at it as essentially, from a policy perspective, a sunk commitment, and not like a mistake, like you blew it, right. but just that it's, that as, you, as your questioning elicited, our range, that 150 to $250 million cited up above, assumes that competitively procured in-state renewables, like a request for proposals mm -hmm. from time to time, like the standard offer, um, but sources, point being not net metering, um, would uh, provide the difference between a 10% requirement and ramping up to 20. And this costs of 400 million, how much, how much in the terms of percentage is, does that expect, how, what do you expect to get for that? Is that gonna is that gonna be effectively how you answer your current tier two? 
I don't have the exact number, but a large chunk, like not a third, like two thirds or 70 something percent, a large chunk of tier two in the volumes shown there. Um, a large chunk of that 10% tier two requirement would be met by net metering. So if I, let's just say it answers 80% of your current tier two obligation. So uh, if I quickly do the math and then, then that costs 400 million to, to answer but, you know, tier two crudely. So then the second, if we then double it, the second could cost us, on if we're on the low end, around, you know, far less than yes. 400 million. Yes. It's an the interesting price. dynamic. Okay. That's, yeah. that's like up the 150 range is like kind of the low end of yeah. the future. Sure. But yeah. even, even, yeah, okay. Yep. Huh. Um, now, I thought that when people went to get permitted to, to build something under standard offer or under a, one of these smaller projects, and there were transmission costs, that the developer bore those. Yep. That's correct today. So generation projects have to pay for their interconnection costs. I think one of the, so at the GMP sort of distribution <coughs> level, that's the case today. So how, how does that factor into these potential transmission upgrade costs? So we look at that, and, and again, Belco may speak a little bit better than this. That becomes almost like a, an, an aggregate issue that occurs as you start to stack everything up. Do you get to, you know, you probably at some point get to the straw that breaks the back, and do you put $100 million in that project, or are you looking at these, you know, these upgrades need to happen to... If I could, I think to your question, we haven't seen any material manifestation of the, the transmission, the bulk system type upgrades uh, yet. Uh, and, and so we have not seen the costs associated with those in the like power purchase agreements or, or net metering, but the sources we've incurred uh, today, um, uh, that's the difference. Uh, that's why we presented them as two separate lines or additive, because to, to our eyes, they look like a new layer, a new type of cost that is largely not manifested yet. For the record, this is uh, Kirk Johnson again, Bill. But what I would say, uh, Senator, is that we have seen this is a conflict again between the regional competitive wholesale market and your ability to connect. What <coughs> impact does it have on surrounding sources? Within Northeastern Vermont, that so-called SHI zone, Sheffield Highgate <coughs> Export Interface, so, so named. The reason why that is an issue and why there wasn't cost on developer for a, a robust transmission solution is because they don't care. They have cheaper land, the delta between the land cost and development cost between what it is in Connecticut, Massachusetts, buys them space. Further, they don't do a buys full whose space. Buys the developer space in terms of the overall um, financial metrics of the project. Further, they don't have to pay if they're if they can get in, they can get in and say, look, we can sell our product such that they can they can write a contract so that someone is it's deliverable. When ISO New England says there's a reliability problem because there's too much energy in here, they go after the projects they can actually control, which is not solar typically, it's the wind project because that's over which they have control. Now the derby by virtue of its size, right? Correct. And over uh, given the fact that they're transmission connected. And thus, ISO New England has a means to affect reliability and urban control. The PUC, as a proxy to kind of solve this, well, wait a minute, we have only so much headroom for, for uh, transmission capacity, and yet these other projects that aren't serving Vermont are taking it up. What the PUC said is, for a time and all, we're going to say no in the Derby Solar case, because this isn't working. But in terms of that space, that increment of cost for transmission, and how come they're not paying for it yet? As long as there's something in there, they have some way to get into market, even if they cause pain to people who are already there, they don't really, it doesn't necessarily matter. Okay. That would be up okay. to the same. Okay. We'll build it. Okay. Ed McNamara, Department of Public Service. I can also just do a much more simplistic way of explaining this as well. If the utilities need to buy 1,200 megawatts of solar, um, 1,200 megawatts of solar need to get built, or there needs to be paid an alternative compliance payment under the renewable energy standard. So then the question becomes, do the utility pay 
the 60 whatever dollars for the alternative compliance payment for every megawatt effort because they can't get the solar bill because of the transmission costs? Or do they pay the upfront transmission costs of the solar that's built? Typically, yes, a solar developer is responsible for distribution upgrades. Um, however, the assumption that's being made is that solar developers are not going to, when it gets to a certain point that's not economic, they're not going to donate the money to build the transmission upgrades. Right. Rate right. payers are essentially going to That's actually how, how we control the location at yeah. some level. Yeah, they're going to put it in their cost mm -hmm. and then pass it on. The, the, the only other question I think I have for Josh is about Rygate, because we're talking about that. What is the rate impact, as you understand, potential for Rygate? Well, we had that if it's if it's like if it's kept at the same rate as it is today, what is it done? Um, we estimate that um, it, the, uh, the rate impact will depend on um, really two things. One, what price is established uh, on the current bill? We can't know that. Um, the PUC would determine that. If we assume that the uh, price is established at about the same price, which is roughly 10 cents per kilowatt hour uh, of Rygate output, um, the uh, other variable is how much is the power that it provides to Vermont utilities worth. It, it avoids us having to buy sources from elsewhere. We estimate that the net of those two, which uh, represents um, Basically, rate pressure would be on the order of $4 million to $5 million a year for GMP over the next um, uh, decade. That the difference basically between the cost and the uh, power savings it provides. GMP is the only one that would be obliged to buy from it? But uh, <coughs> anybody would get a major, vast majority on the order of 80 81% presently. Yeah. So we've been, the number we've been working with is five million. That's sounds pretty close. <laughs> and that's for a ten-year shot at fifty million. And it has been suggested to us if uh, Massachusetts wind comes on in three, four years, that that'll eat up half the three cent uh, ricks that it gets. So it might bump up to five and a half or six million a year once Mass is at it. Is that a reasonable thing to worry about? piece is interesting. I mean, does it offset that? Uh, I would say at, at a high level within some small tolerance, yes. Our market outlook that underlies that four to five million dollar a year figure I mentioned does assume a dynamic like uh, Senator McDonald just described. That is a gradual, not a crash, but a drop in the renewable energy certificate market, uh, which is one of the forms of value that we get for that power. So, yeah, I think so you know, what pretty good understanding. If we don't renew the contract. For the more renewables. Uh, cheaper renewables would fill the gap. Mm. Uh, GMT would be able to um, uh, essentially shop for the energy and capacity uh, that we presently obtain from Rygate from you know a, uh, a mix of uh, sources. We wouldn't have any renew the renewable energy certificate revenue we presently get from them, but we could shop uh, uh, from other sources at again a rough savings, like I'm estimating, four million to five million a year uh, cheaper. Okay. For ten years. But you would buy that off yes, the grid or uh, from in-state renewables. It could be from a wide range uh, uh, in state. It could be from uh, a broker or from the ISO New England market. Um, we've, we'd have to, to look at that. But it's not a large chunk of power for us that, that requires us to have any sort of, um, uh, we, we can handle those differences okay. in the normal course of forecasting. We can cause a, right. No prices. Okay. You buy cheaper for 50 million. All right. Okay, thanks. Okay, and we're ready to go on to your solutions. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, basically, what what we we hit on a little bit last time, we're talking about with tier two, is that we just look at the next, the second ten percent <coughs> doubling of it to be. There's already a defined term, new renewable, in in, in statute, and essentially is it's new renewables after 2015, and falls in that date as well. Um, so it just wouldn't have. Size cap or location cap or location requirement. Um, 
and that's that's the extent of it essentially would basically be um, looking to be able to procure a new renewable energy from within Vermont or outside of Vermont. Okay, so don't do twenty percent but give you the flexibility of getting it at the least cost Le least cost, right in diversity. You know, again, it might, as we think about the importance of other technologies in the mix that, that may allow wind to be part of it, that may allow um, hydro's tough. I don't see a lot of new hydro being built, but, um, you know, other new resources into the mix that help balance things out as well as get more cost effective. Okay. Is there new hydro, Hydro Quebec, are they building massive new dams? They are. <coughs> Yeah. Because that's, I think, the concern with Hydro Quebec yeah. is methane yeah. and flooding, and but I assume we can't tell which dam are. Well, yeah, and we are in the in the grand scheme of things, Vermont is is so minuscule in their mix that I think they they dumped last year twice as much as Vermont uses in an entire year just to, you know not producing so. So we don't have any market power. Yeah, well, we'll market power, but, but we only have our own. Yeah, I mean, we don't, they, they, they got them. They're not going under if we pull out. No. They're already under. Okay. Okay. So, it, it, yeah, all right. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Melissa Bailey with Vermont Public Power Supply Authority, and I'm just following up on testimony from last week. Um, we did have some proposed statutory language uh, related to small-scale municipally owned hydro facilities in Vermont. Um, the request from BEPSA is to have these um, encompassed under the definition of Tier 2 resource. Okay, we have that. What I didn't... Oh, we have one that's marked up, but it, I couldn't find out who it was from. So it might help if some people... Right, it talk to Senate because then I'll know who wants it. If it's the one that was red marked, yep. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. I apologize for not making that. That's work. okay. It just so, it's a I can't tell if it's from Ledge Council or a member of the public or where it is. So fair enough. Okay. My name is Mel Mark. I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy to answer any questions around the hydro request. Well, tell us what this would do. Is this in tier two? This would be making um, existing community-owned hydro facilities eligible for tier two in Vermont. And that would place a value on existing renewable resources as we promote uh, the development of new renewable resources. And um, we, we believe this is appropriate because our hydro facilities are seeing reduced output um, as they adhere to the new updated clean water standards. And this is resulting in lower generation and lower value flowing back to the community from these existing renewable resources. So making them tier two eligible would essentially um, improve the benefit, the financial benefit to the communities that own these facilities. All right, I'm having tier two is supposed to be the development of new resources, but these are existing resources. These are existing resources, and so it would be a change to the definition of tier two to say that um, hydro facilities that are now adhering to new water quality standards um, should be should be encompassed under tier two in order to keep them financially viable. Our, our so are basically it would let you out of tier two? Um, it wouldn't let us out of tier two. We would still have the same 20% requirement that is being okay, contemplated but here. But right now, right. some of you are already at 100% hydro, right? Or pretty close. Swanton Electric is 100% renewable. And, and utilities that are 100% renewable, which include Burlington, Swanton, and WEC, are um, exempted from tier two or all under current statute. So this conversation doesn't pertain to those this would be <laughs> utilities. But um, a handful of our other utilities, we have 11 municipal members and five own hydro facilities. And those would have a very portion of their um, existing power supply portfolio. <coughs> and this would allow them to um, use that hydro generation that, where the benefits flow 100% to the community. There's no out of state ownership, there's no out of state developer. Um, those resource, those, that value would um, remain with the utility. There would still be added, um, I think as I presented last week, we're developing 10 megawatts of solar. That would also be going towards our tier two requirement. Of course, we're operating a metering program. So this wouldn't um, let the municipal utilities out of tier two, but it would give us an added resource that could be eligible for tier two. 
what, what can you give us a sense of the range, like the the utility with the with like one of these dams? What percentage of their load is generated by that dam? Sure, it really varies, and I think that was my testimony from last week. I apologize, I don't have that in front of me. But Swanton, it, it has 100% of, of their mm -hmm. um, generation essentially comes from hydro contracts and would not be part of this conversation. Um, I believe the others range from maybe 5 to 15% of their portfolio. Their own hydro. Comes from their own hydro that the utility owns. And I will clarify that um, BEPSA's tier 2 um, obligation applies in aggregate across our 11 members. Uh, so it, it wouldn't necessarily be that that one utility that has 12% hydro would apply that 12% to tier 2. It's our overall um, portfolio that is required to meet the tier 2 requirement. Is this the chart to look at? Um, nope. There is a table that lists the hydro, the um, municipalities that own hydro facilities and their annual output. Yes, and so um, I will note that the um, the facilities that have gone through this relicensing are the Morrisville and Lindenville hydro units. So those are, those numbers are reflective of the reduced output. Um, typically, they see a 30 to 40 percent reduction in their uh, generation after going through relicensing. So the future, so some of these other numbers would not be reflective of um, the reductions that we're anticipating over the next. Um, our relicensing processes go over the next roughly four to five years. Okay. Okay. I think we have any questions. Right. Um, the only other proposal in the uh, markup that I had to the committee was, again, to have the same Hydro-Quebec limit across all utilities, whatever the committee decides is appropriate for a limit on um, HQ as compliance for Tier 1. Um, our position is that that should be equitable on all utilities. Amongst all utilities or all depths of utilities? All utilities. I mean, the bill as drafted says you're going to have 35% of your basically tier one compliance come from Hydro Quebec, unless, <laughs> unless you currently exceed that, in which case you can stay at the level you are currently at. Mm -hmm. And so our position is that, that whatever level is set should be um, consistent across utilities. So is it all right as written? Everybody can have up to 35. Change changing. This allows for different limits to apply to different utilities. All right. I think this is well qualified to make this point as she represents utilities that may have as many as 30 homes per mile and other utilities that have you know half that many per mile and this one just says equity, I think she means that those figures in account don't make and, and don't make having one size fits all regardless of what you, each utility's ID um, difficulties in reaching those standards. Is that a fair characterization? As fair as I usually get? That's a fair characterization. Such a standard as you usually get? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, committee, we have got about five minutes left for what was taped as committee discussion. We have four day, three days next week, and then the week we get back. But this one really needs to come out next week because it needs to go back to natural resources. Um, so we need to start doing some fish yeah, or cut bait, and we don't have time to do that now. And we have another very heavy agenda item, heavy in witnesses coming up. Um, but I think you can assume we are not going to get out of here at 3 o'clock on Friday. We may, we'll see how we do today and perhaps start doing some thinking about what you want to do um, 
to get us through this. Tier one seems to be fine, except for the percentage of hydro Quebec or the limit, which they prefer not to have. It's the tier two. Do we do a hard 20? Do, you know, what's the mix? What's, how much, I don't feel like I have any power as to where to say hydro siding should go, but I think I could tell the P, not hydro. So, but I think we might be able to tell the PUC See that we would like them yeah. to achieve certain goals within and percentage and no impact or minimal impact on the transmission. It sounds like, we, I know we have lots of transmission lines running into Brattleboro, so if we could find a way to do some solar there, it might be very helpful. Um, that just might get shipped off to Massachusetts, but um, see, but just think through. We've got some alternatives proposed, we've got the bill, and we've got a whole lot of issues. So, okay, our, this we are going to repealing the sunset uh, 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 on the 240A process. And I've, I've got Ellen and Greg because they can each tell one. But this is the 240, you can go through the 240A or Act 250. I believe this is telecommunications. Um, it's been 248A. We have extended the sunset seven times or three. But it's four. Times, it? four. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's, or this is the fourth. So we're just, at this point, been asked to just put it in, do away with the sunset, and make it the law of the land. So, and I took the testimony on the 5G before we took this bill back up. We went through it once because that seemed to be the concern was the dispersal of 5G in public notice. I heard, I don't know if anyone else heard differently, that other than screening, we are pretty much preempted from doing anything. And screening meaning bushes, not lead shields. Um, from doing anything with 5G. So I think there's some still I'm getting emails about some creative solutions, but I think we can look at those, um, you know, at some point. But the general rule is the feds have preempted anything other than those local screening locations as long as they don't have the effect of banning it from the marketplace. I think I'm correct. Okay, so we're going to start with Ellen and Greg, and um, you can come up together, but that's the balance. It used to be 250 or a choice, and we put it in the 248, which was a little faster, um, maybe not as comprehensive, and we've had lots of experience, so. Go. Uh, Ellen Schenkowski, Office of Legislative Council. So, Act 250 and Section 248A are, are, are different. They are both permitting processes, um, but they're administered by different agencies. So, so broadly to start, Act 250, uh, is a permitting process for development. There are 10 environmental criteria that an applicant has to demonstrate um, that they comply with in order to get their Act 250 pro uh, permit. The permit is submitted to district commissions. Those are local three, pan uh, three member panels. There are nine of them in the state, so where your project is located, you submit your application to the local commission. Uh, 
and they review your application to see if it met the 10 criteria. Then, uh, if it's a major application, a hearing is held, and there are there's the ability for uh, interested parties and citizens to participate in that hearing process. Decisions by the district commissions are appealable to the environmental court de novo, and a, a final layer of appeal can be brought to the Supreme Court. So that's the high level uh, of Act 250 permitting. Do you okay. want to talk about Act uh, 250? Sure, sure. I'm great favor with the, the PUC. I saw, I'll do a high level, similar high level. Um, yeah, that, I'm, I'm trying to do a side by side here to figure out. So 248, out. it's optional. You can either go, go through Act 250 or use the 248 process. Right. It's sort of unusual in that respect. Now it's optional. Um, okay. And we use the same criteria that Act 250 uses, so that's similar in, in okay. our review. Um, but under 248A, we've developed uh, three different flavors, uh, as you, if you will, of, of telecommunication uh, installations. Hopefully one isn't menthol. <laughs> inside well, joke. inside this ball. Uh, uh, yeah. You guys, the old yeah. thing. Yeah. You're on the team. I'm on the what, the, the smallest is de minimis modifications. The, the, the second largest is uh, limited size and scope, and then everything above that, uh, larger uh, installations. Um, de minimis modifications are basically when you're swapping out antennas on, a, on an existing facility, or perhaps you're attaching antennas to a farm silo, something like that, very small installations. Um, limited size and scope, uh, a little bit bigger, you can actually permit a small uh, telecom facility, a brand new one, as long as, as long as it's not over 140 feet in height of the tower, and you're not disturbing more than 10,000 square feet to build your road and your, your facility compound. And then above that is it's everything else, everything that's bigger than that. Typically what we see at the PUC is um, probably 80% of the applications we get are for de minimis modifications. Uh, so basically swapping out antennas and putting stuff on buildings, farm silos, things like that. Um, the majority of the rest are limited size and scope of facilities. Um, uh, let's see, as far as notice goes, um, for de minimis modification, the town gets notified, the host landowner gets notified, and the, the Department of Public Service gets notified. Um, however, the only thing you can object to for a de minimis modification is whether it qualifies as a de minimis modification. These, these projects have been deemed to be, well, de minimis, very minimal in impact, so there's no real, there's no real um, objections you can make. Um, limited size and scope, uh, that goes to the typical uh, part. Limited size and scope and larger, they all go to the, the adjoining landowners, the town, A&R, all those folks. Um, and there are, you, you can raise any objections you want under uh, aesthetics or, or what have you, floodways, whatever you want to raise. Um, let's see, what else? Okay. I think that's about Is it. Is there an appeal level. on this one? Uh, any, any order of the public, uh, public facility commission yeah. is, appealed to, is appealed to the Supreme Court. Okay. So, Typically, there are not hearings on these cases unless, of course, someone um, files a motion to intervene and, and that motion to intervene is granted. Then we'll have hearings. The vast majority are, are done without hearings. They're just done. Okay, so this is much faster for yeah. Yeah. hanging a new antenna. Um, right. And like I said, the vast majority are swapping out antennas on existing facilities or maybe attaching antennas to a building or a, or a farm silo or something like okay. that. Okay. Okay. But the town and all the adjoining landowners are notified. So if anyone's concerned... Well, for the very small ones, the yeah. adjoining landowners are not notified. Just the landowner. But again, the only thing you can object to for the very small ones is whether it qualifies as being very, very small. small. So okay. there's real no, really no reason to know, you know. Mm -hmm. You really couldn't say much even if you were notified. So that's kind of the way it works. And this is all set forth in statute. These aren't our 
rules. Right. These are statutory. These are statutory. Yeah. And Act 250 can basically set almost any standards or requirements to get a permit. Can you, are, is 248 limited to screening? Can you do screening? We, we use the same criteria that Act 250 uses. Okay. Some of them are waived for the smaller ones. All right. Uh, but they have to meet all the same criteria. That's right. Yep. All right. But the Public Utility Commission makes that decision, right? Not. That's right. So it's all done at the state level the as district. opposed to the town and the district okay. commission level. All right. Okay. Local zoning planning, is that, that's part of it? If you go through Act 250, you probably have to get a local zoning permit also. Also. Okay. And, and under 248A, your, your, your permit <coughs> has to be consistent with any existing Act 250 or local zoning permits. Okay. So they are considered, or they have to be consistent. Mm -hmm. All right. That's Either right. way. Act 250 can override a local permit, though, I believe. At least they've, I've had it done. So. Um, also, I think with, with 248A, another difference is uh, it has to be found to be in the public good, right? So you don't necessarily find that in an act. Of that's right. Yeah. Okay. So that's, a, that's sort of an overriding. Yeah. So it's a it's a, a difference. Um, criteria or goal. Yeah. Okay. So I can't just put it up because I feel like putting it up. I have to show that there is a public good connected with it. Yes, you have to show the objective and why you're doing it and why it complies with the telecom plan and things like that. Okay. Okay. Committee. Are we all clear before we start? All right. Okay. All right. So we're going to start through our witness list at this point, and first is Charles Storo. Can, 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 yes. Can we ask the PUC if they have a position on this committee? Uh, you can ask the PUC if they have a, well, Greg. Greg, does the PUC have a position on this bill? Well, we support the elimination of the sunset. Okay. Greg is on the, uh, Witness list. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, have we got two chairs? Good. Oh, we've got an empty one over there. All right. Good afternoon, committee. Thank you for uh, giving us this time. I'm Chuck Storo from Leonine Public Affairs. I'm here on behalf of AAP. And to my right is Owen Smith. He's uh, president of AT&T for uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Um, we're here to uh, support uh, S301, uh, and um, what I'm going to do is go through the Section 248 a little bit and talk about some of the features, try not to repeat what you just heard too much. And, and um, we have copious paper. paper on, I don't know if it's in your folders, but it is online. It should be in your folders. Well, it's, 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 it's also it's in your it's folders. In the, uh, 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 a bunch of uh, documents to the uh, committee, basically an outline of my testimony, an outline of Mr. Smith's testimony, a listing of the sites that at and macro sites, which are the larger sites, uh, has constructed since it acquired themselves network in 2009. Uh, a document from the uh, Department of Public Service that dates from January 2017, which was the last time we were talking about extending the sunset, that shows that through that period of time, 566 certificates of public good under 248A had been granted and broken them out uh, to those various categories. And then some documents uh, of limited size as well, full petition, de minimis. And then some documents uh, showing uh, how the company interacts with uh, municipalities, and regional planning commissions, in citing decisions. Um, 248A was enacted in 2007 in connection with the creation of the Vermont Telecom Authority. Um, it uh, was intended to provide for a streamlined permitting process for the, the permitting of uh, wireless telecom facilities. 
It came originally with a sunset of July 1, 2010. Uh, the sunset has been extended four times since then. And we would submit that over the 12 years that the statute's been on the book, there's been a large volume of activity under that statute that's been relatively free from controversy, and that now is the time to repeal the sunset. Um, 248A, um, one of the advantages of 248A is that it does provide for one-stop permitting. Um, without 248A, we would have to go through uh, Act 250, and in the towns, town zoning, which is most of the towns in Vermont, also have to go through local zoning. Uh, you have to satisfy both regulatory regimes. I've done a lot of Act 250 permitting work in, some, in my capacity as a lawyer, and you can get a situation where you get bounced back and forth, you get a permit from one that's got conditions that then require getting the conditions from the other uh, regulatory authorities uh, uh, modified to, so they, they, they sync up. But, so it's, it's, just, it's easier in that regard. Um, nonetheless, uh, 248A requires that um, a project, uh, that the Public uh, Utilities Commission gives substantial deference to the local plan and to the local zoning bylaws. And um, the, the phrase substantial deference is in there. Uh, it's not an absolute standard. There's times when the PUC can permit a project that doesn't strictly comply with local zoning, and that's as it should be because sometimes local zoning is simply incompatible with being able to site a wireless telecom facility. And I can give an example of uh, the towns that have bylaws that say a, a tower can only extend 20 feet above the existing tree line um, in Vermont or a mature forest. You're going to have trees that are about 190 to 100 feet tall. So that gives you 20 feet of space above the tree lines. Cell technology is line of sight. Um, you may not be able to propagate very far if you can only go 20 feet above this uh, uh, tree line. And uh, it certainly makes it very difficult to co-locate uh, multiple carriers on one tower if it's only going to be a 120 foot tall tower because each carrier has its own delay of antennas that has to be separated so many distances from the other carriers and antennas. So we've been very clear we want co-location so we don't have Lots of towers. In fact, the uh, 248A has within it basically a requirement that if you can collate, co locate, thou shalt co locate. Um, so um, that's one reason why, um, you know, it, it, local zoning should not be an absolute uh, criteria, but the Public Utilities Commission has been very good at balancing the need for. Uh, coverage and the need to, for propagation of the signal with local zoning and there's been cases where and I can provide us and need be where the public utility commission said no you can maintain uh, the or meet the setback from the boundary line you know so a lot of zoning says you can't build within so many feet of the, of, of the boundary uh, you can still have um, adequate signal if you move it and comply with that but then there's been other cases where they say no yeah, to the town, you may go above the, the height restriction because otherwise you're not going to cover enough. And um, there's, you can't have, I mean, basically what that would drive is you have to have more towers to cover the same area. Mm -hmm. So there's trade-offs that are involved in each case that um, 248A allows the uh, Public Utility Commission to factor in all of these variables that are unique to each site and come up with the best result. And you don't get that it, through uh, local zoning, and you don't get that through Act 50 either. Act 50 is an absolute standard. In other words, you have to meet the criteria. And if you, it doesn't matter how good it is, what you're proposing, if you don't meet the criteria, you don't get a permit. And on balance, again, I would submit that um, given the volume of activity that's gone on, um, the, the use of 248A has been relatively controversial free, and therefore, you know, there's no, nothing going on out there in the world um, that is running roughshod over any of our values. Okay, but, Jack, I'm going to have to ask, I think, everybody to kind of limit it to like five minutes because we've got a long witness list. 
Okay, so um, I guess, you know, to be honest with you, um, the towns have a seat at the table. There's a requirement to go meet with the towns in advance. The company does that, even if they're, they're, they're not required. We've been doing that. You'll see from the documents in your files, uh, feedback that we can get from the towns of the regional planning commissions. And I guess with that, I would turn it over to Mr. Stamp to, to just talk about what this statute means for the company. Okay. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you, Senator Cummings, and the rest of the committee for allowing us to be here today. <clears throat> AT&T um, uses 248A exclusively and has since it came out in 2007. Um, since 2014, AT&T has um, invested well over $100 million in our network here in Vermont. Uh, we've added over 50 cell sites um, since we've been doing business in the state, since, since late 2008-2009. Uh, we've done over 400 upgrades to our network um, from 2G to 3G, 4G, um, looking at 5G, doing preparations for that. Um, data traffic on the network since we introduced the iPhone back in 2007 has increased 470,000%. So a lot of the work that we do in those 400 upgrades are putting more radios, more antennas on, on the hundreds of sites that we have uh, here in Vermont. Um, recently, we were uh, the recipient of a contract to build out a first responders network across the country, including here in Vermont. Um, our first site came on uh, at the end of December in Townsend, a town that had no cell coverage before AT&T put a site there. <clears throat> um, we also turned on a site last month, or uh, yeah, last month uh, in Berlin. <clears throat> We've got 18 new sites forecasted for this year. It's going to be a big year for us uh, around this first net project. Uh, we also um, have a company, a roaming partner called Great Northwoods Wireless. Uh, they're putting six sites up in Essex County. Um, Norton and Averill uh, have been permitted, um, so we have CPGs for both of those sites. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about those two sites. Okay, Norton, just one question. With these, um, these special sites, the do they also provide cell service commercial to coverage. commercial coverage? They do. Okay. One so. and the same. When when they get built, our commercial uh, and, and the first net network are one and the same. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Norton uh, was the first site that this roaming partner permitted. They did not know about 248A, and they took it through Act 250. And by the time uh, they hired the attorney that does all of our siting, Will Dodge, it was too late to, to switch gears. Um, a year and a half later, in a court case in the Supreme Court, um, that site got permitted two months ago, um, after a year and a half, uh, with three times the legal cost that normally uh, would, would, would cost through uh, 248A. Averill also just got a CPG. That went through 248A and took four months to go through with a fraction of the cost to, to, to get that done. Both of those are going to start construction over the next 60 days and will be built this year, along with four other sites, uh, went on Avery Gore, uh, Lunenburg, and Canaan. This company also just recently turned on a site down in Reesboro, again, another community that has had no cell coverage, uh, and today they have, um, they have coverage. <clears throat> so we've got a lot of work to do, um, and not only are we expanding geography-wise um, into areas that, that don't have coverage, we're continuously upgrading and almost always will be upgrading our network to the, the, the latest and greatest and adding capacity uh, for various reasons. Um, we have an obligation through FirstNet with the federal government to go to places where we typically, we haven't gone before with our commercial network because there wasn't a business case. So we, we need 248A uh, more than ever to expand this network out into these areas. At the same time, we need to densify using 248A, whether it's Bennington or Burlington or Stowe. Um, we need to build capacity and do upgrades to those networks. <clears throat> um, 248A, and I've said this before, is the most efficient wireless permitting uh, statute in all of New England. Uh, we talk about it all the time in these other states. It's good for the municipality. It's good for the company. Um, we pride ourselves in working with the municipalities. Um, we have met with townspeople, planning boards, 
select board 75% of the time. Um, and we don't necessarily have to do that, but we choose to do that. Um, we've made changes to um, the original proposed plans more than 50% of the time based on feedback from the community, whether it's um, aesthetic design, um, difference in the height, you want to move a diff different partial or environmental concerns. Um, we work with the community. In all, we've attended over 100 meetings um, with communities on, on these issues, and uh, that includes municipalities, regional planning commissions, to talk about coverage, what our objectives are, but also to listen to the community on what their concerns are. Um, in some cases, we have um, completely aborted sites um, and walked away from them and or, or moved them completely. So I've got a, um, three quick examples that are all very recent. Uh, Grand Isle, um, we had an original site on a place called Lover's Lane. It was uh, owned by the Water District. Um, there were some abutters that came out in opposition. Um, we uh, had a couple of meetings with the, the uh, Planning Board and Select Board and, and quickly decided that we needed to move this location, which we did. Um, and actually, as of this morning, we received the CPG um, Certificate of Public Good. I'm sorry. Um, we're waiting to be filing uh, this uh, CPG for Grand Isle. But we got a, a letter from the Select Board, uh, which I've included. Uh, in the paper, in the, um, it's in Ms. Pistaro's paperwork, yeah. Uh, I've highlighted what they've said. Uh, same thing with Mount Holly. We've changed the design uh, based on input from the Planning Commission. Um, we have uh, taken a, a, a monopole and turned it into a monopine uh, that looks like a pine tree with certain colors and uh, buffers built into it. Um, at the request of the town. Um, also in the town of Derby, um, based on uh, uh, feedback from the neighborhood and uh, village trustee opposition, we completely pulled out of that site, uh, uh, pulled back on the CPG and I found a different site in Derby. So all of these are examples, all in the last 60 days, where we have listened to what the community has had to say and we've, we've uh, adjusted our plans and have been uh, commended by the various municipalities and uh, planning commissions. So we understand what the legislature want, what the book wants, what the uh, department wants. We, we listen uh, and interact with municipalities most of the time. Um, whenever we need to, we do. Uh, we've been using this exclusively for over 10 years, and we think that it works extremely well. Uh, we don't see a reason to uh, change this, ratchet it up at all, um, and having to come back here every three years and, and get it renewed. Um, and I guess we ask you to uh, pass 301 and uh, make it permanent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Thank you. Greg, do you have more to add here? Come on up. Yeah, I really don't have too much. Uh, okay. I don't want to take up any time here, but um, we, we support eliminating the sunset. Um, as you can imagine, it's a bit of a workload problem for us. You know, this thing is sunsetting every three years. We don't know from year to year how much work we're going to need to do. It's also hard to plan. Um, just last month, I got a, a motion to uh, amend our our. our, our standards and procedures which, go, which govern this um, program. And one of the reasons I denied the motion was because, um, hey, this thing's going to sunset in July. Why would we amend the procedures now? Why would we do that? Um, so it makes it hard to, to um, plan ahead. Um, so. Well, are we, uh, uh, is it 248A that's something, or the, the requirement for the CPG for 248A? 248A um, is an optional section, yeah. so that would go away. Our authority okay. under 248A would go away. It would all be 250 after yeah, that. Exactly. All and is this, this is telecom, right? It, it does, doesn't do solar fields? That's 248. That's 240. Well, okay. A whole so this yeah, is a whole different section. It's a whole different section. Doesn't do windmills. No. No. All no. right. This is telecom. Oh, and only Power. telecom. Yeah. Only that's, telecom. That's what this is. Okay. All right. Who's the lead sponsor on this? Have we heard from him? I'm joking. Oh, we 
Okay. Thank you. What's that? I don't want to. Any questions as to this point? All right. Thank you. So we are on to Annette Smith, who is on the phone. Annette, are you still there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can yes. hear you fine. I know you know the routine. Just introduce yourself. My name is Annette Smith. I'm Executive Director of Vermonters for a Clean Environment. Thank the committee for hearing my testimony today. I've prepared two documents for you. One is the statute with uh, some red lines, adding and deleting. The other is the document called Section 248A. I'd like to start with that. Um, okay. I've been uh, on a steep learning curve for the last year looking at Section 248A. I do support uh, eliminating the sunset, but I think that the statute uh, needs to be updated. It's been in place for 13 years, and it, there are some inconsistencies that I've found in it, and also um, there are some new technology coming along. So you'll see in the, the picture on the front page, there are two churches. These are two churches that have permits for uh, antennas and the seasons. <coughs> They're both Verizon. However, one of them went through the regular limited scope and size process, which uh, gave notification to adjoiners and there was a historic review. And the other one was de minimis and contained no notification to adjoiners and no historic review. So I thought the PUC made a mistake and uh, called them on it and they said no. Uh, it had to do with the uh, size of the extension of the, the generator shed to the addition of the church. And if it's more than 10 feet, then it goes through the larger process. And if it's less than 10 feet, it goes through de minimis. That, I'm sorry, it just doesn't make any sense to me. And so I'm going to um, propose that there be some changes to the three uh, different areas. Um, my written comments here follow the order of the statute, so I'll, I'll just go through them from there. Um, I'm going to suggest that for small cell installations, and that's the new technology that we're seeing, that this committee consider granting municipalities the authority to site small cell installations. Are we talking 5G cells here? Well, I'm, I'm not being specific about whatever the frequency is. Okay, um, but this, you understand this, uh, the Fed say we something that we can't. only have been seeing in the last couple of years. You can do so it was not in place in uh, 2007 when Section 248A came in to play. And I want to thank Ellen of Legislative Council for her very uh, good review of 5G preemption and, and issues. And she did say that uh, the, the FCC does have preemption, but it left state and local governments the authority over siting of wireless telecommunications facilities. So the specific issue, issue I'm looking at is siting. So I'm suggesting that a definition of small cell installation be added to the definitions. And I got that off the CPIA, that's the uh, Wireless Industries uh, Organization. That's the definition that they gave. It means small radio equipment and antennas that can be placed on structures such as street lights, the size of buildings and poles. The categories, I, I, I admit, I thought there were only two categories because usually I see regular limited size and scope altogether versus the minimum. My suggestion is that regular be specifically for new facilities including towers, including new utility poles. I've seen petitions for uh, small cell antennas on brand new poles. And I believe that those new structures, whatever they are, should require the full notice and the full application. The second one, limited size and scope, and scope that's additions, modifications, replacements at um, the uh, already existing facilities. And that includes any increases in the radio frequency of the antennas that are being put up. My suggestion about de minimis, which has been pointed out, is being used a lot and is being done in a way that, that I believe deprives the public of adequate notice. I suggest that that be changed to be limited only to previously permitted telecommunications facilities with no increase in radio frequency. I'm, these are suggestions, but I'm, I'm bringing this to your attention after having studied a lot of these CPGs and uh, trying to understand the process and what's in place right now in this statute does not make sense because of the what I pointed out in the, the church issue. <coughs> um, findings. Um, one of the, the new issues that I haven't heard anybody 
mention is the need for potential co-location of small cell networks. And I don't understand how that will work. So for instance, let's say in Burlington, you have Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, and some other carriers all building out small cell antennas. Is there any opportunity for co-location for different providers? Could it be that one company would come in and sort of gobble up all of the best space and almost create a monopoly? I, this is a, an area that I don't, I, I don't know how other states or cities handle it, but that's again why I'm suggesting that it might be in the interest of a municipality to play a role in the, uh, how these networks are built out so that they might say, well, how about not that pole, but how about that pole? And I, I think that the, you know, from reviewing a, a lot of the files and, and every time I click on the public comment, I mean, nobody participates in any of these things. And I, I think that that may change as the, uh, the uh, build out of more of these small cell installations happens. On notice, um, I, I think that the uh, uh, you know, notification, except for the de minimis that I'm suggesting, should be all to, to everyone, to the adjoiners. And then for small cell installations, I think it should be for all the property owners within 500 feet. And then that would give people the opportunity of saying, well, hey, I want it in front of my house, or I don't want it in front of my house. So this goes to aesthetics and property values. Um, and so I'm suggesting, again, adding in a, an option for the municipalities to permit the siding of small cell installations, only those, not, I'm not talking about the other types. And um, this bullet point list under I is what I'm told people are doing in, uh, in cities like in Elk Grove, California. Those are some of the things that they've done. Not permit a cell antenna in residential neighborhood or immediately adjacent to a front yard of a residential dwelling or say, hey, could you just move it down the street um, and maybe have a certain distance uh, between the antenna and the nearest home. Uh, there is a section in the statute about retention of experts. Uh, I'm seeing places where, and I, you know, this is what Vermonters are bringing to me, places where they have real questions about whether the uh, installation is actually in compliance with the FCC or emission standards. Some people have suggested that it should be just required of every facility once a year. I'm suggesting maybe that, or maybe uh, at the request of a municipal legislative body, planning commission, or a joiner. Or, um, so that's a section that I think could be beefed up a little bit. Um, I do support uh, eliminating the option of going through Act 250, and that will close the loophole that exists there, because right now somebody can put up a brand new pole that's, uh, I think it's 49 feet tall, and uh, not get any regulatory review at all. And uh, I understand that Vermont Tell has done that. I, I've seen one installation in Marlboro that when I tried to track it down, I learned, oh, they went through Act 50, but it's a 49 foot pole. And so there is absolutely no regulatory record of it anywhere. Um, and so I, on page three, I've got just some examples. Uh, that this is a, a I think an AT&T small cell installation outside of a residence in Burlington. Uh, we've documented several of those. Um, and uh, maybe that's okay with the community, but I do think that these small cell antennas pre present an opportunity for perhaps a better uh, way of siting if the municipalities play a role in it. Uh, the next one is two antenna facilities next to Rice Memorial High School in South Burlington. One of them is WCAX, so that's on the left. One of them is WOKO Radio. Um, and the, you know, the ball field is within 400 feet, the high school ball field. It would seem like an appropriate place for the requirement of post-construction uh, emissions monitoring. But um, <coughs> recently, there was an application to add one antenna to one of those installations. And so I filed that as a public comment. And the company immediately responded and said, we don't have to do that. This is de minimis. So I think that the, the way it's written right now is too narrow, and that it, I think it's reasonable to ask when there are these uh, these sites that have a lot of antennas on them, that uh, and when they are in proximity, say to a school, that it's reasonable to uh, have a, an option of option or a requirement to actually assure that they're in compliance with the FCC standards. And finally, on the last page, um, I just wanted to show you what we found in terms of what's been uh,
developed so far in Chittenden County. This is mostly AT&T, some is uh, Verizon. It's not a complete list, but it, the yellow pushkins are uh, the small cell antennas on utility poles. And that's my testimony, and I'm sorry I went over okay. five minutes. No, that was very concise. Thank you. Committee, do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Actually, yeah. And you're going to you're gonna stay on and listen. You do have oh, I'm okay. sorry, I just hung up. So you hung up? I did. I thought that when she just hung I apologize. Okay. Faith, can you get her back on the board? You board? Uh, and that's right. It's not. Senator Campion. No, I hung up. I, I, I thought we were finished. I apologize. It's not. <laughs> It's not that her friend. No, she wants to listen. Okay. Sorry. That she was she was in here to listen. So so um, in terms of our um, our charge right now, right. I know we don't have a whole lot of time to take up a lot of these suggestions, but is there time in house? And then, yeah, there should be because these are changes to the present exactly. law. Right. And I know Greg's Sorry, testimony Dave. was it's going to sunset, so you know, you and, and that's an ongoing thing. You don't, so I think we can ask them to look at it and make appropriate <laughs> updates with new, given new technology, and something like that at the end. Okay, all right, Annette, you're back on. Yes, I am. Okay, Sorry about I apologize, that. Senator Campion got. Only enthusiastic with his job. <laughs> yeah. I, I believe there's a question from uh, Senator Soraka. Yes, there is. Thank you, Senator Kim. Absolutely. Okay. Um, when you, in, in your proposals about the municipalities for an exciting of small cell installations, uh, I'm not following the difference between a small cell installation versus the terminology that's used in the categories existing right now for towers, poles, uh, telecommunication, telecommunication facilities. Is it? That's because it's not clear which it is. Um, I think that that might be a better question to ask Greg Faber is what, what category does those, do those fit in? I think that they go in as de minimis. Well, is it, but is it your Understanding of a small cell installation is like a. I wish we had some. Maybe we have some pictures here. Actually, there's a picture in what I submitted on page uh, three. That's a small cell installation outside a residence in Burlington. Is it the, the, is it the, the little? The pieces of that installation are the canister antenna is on the top of the pole. Right. And then there is a box. I don't know what the box does. And then there's also a meter. So, so it's not a small installation. I mean this. This issue goes to aesthetics and it goes to property values. And there's a lot of good evidence that, that uh, having these telecommunication systems next to homes can reduce property values. It is a concern for some people. I, I appreciate that, but I guess I'm trying to understand whether when you talk about small cell installation, you're talking about these little boxes going on an existing pole. I mean, I think the, the aesthetics and property value is more a pole than a small addition. Uh, not, no, unless unless you're talking about, talking about all the wires that accompany it. I don't know. Yeah. And then it's the antenna that's the issue. Which part is the antenna? The on top? On the top of the pole, above the street light. Why is that the issue? It looks like an extension of the pole to me. For the property value issue, it is that people will choose to not live near uh, some of these things. It is a, it's a real issue. Radio right. Okay. All right. Any other questions? If not... Annette, this is uh, Senator Ballant. I just wanted to let you know when uh, Senator Campion accidentally cut you off, the question that I was asking the chair, Senator Cummings, is to clarify the amount of time that we have in dealing with this bill currently. and. Um, what the chair said is that we, we really need to move this out so that we can deal with um, the repeal first 
before get that over to the house before crossover and then they can look at um, some of these changes that you've um, have suggested in this document these are true. I have been in touch with Chair Brinkman and he has uh, said he will let me know when it is time to testify okay that's good then great we can the most you know at this point what we can do is ask the PUC to look at the uh, the regulations and see that if they're any, any I mean, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not trying to write legislative statutes or anything. I'm just putting in placeholders for ideas because um, I, there actually is some discussion recently that I've seen, for instance, about Brattleboro might want to get involved in siting. And, and I, I think that it's time just on the small cell to, to consider that. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Stephen Whitaker. Oh. Uh, this is a complex bill at the same time that Act 250 is being re reformed, at the same time as the rulemaking on home attachments just went through, uh, including small cells, uh, which was unknown to some folks. The responsible thing to do would be to extend Act 248A by another year or two and get your head around the complex ramifications of this. Uh, in effect, the wireless industry here is trying to preempt uh, local prerogative in, and opportunity. And it's not uh, all peaches and cream. There, you heard that a certificate of public good and a, definite, a finding of the public good uh, is granted by the PUC, uh, but there is no definition of public good. Uh, that's something you should consider uh, in this. The 10-year telecommunications plan will be done uh, supposedly by December. That will have a significant bearing on these issues. So I would ask that action on removing the sunset of 248A be informed by the first ever complete telecommunications plan done by an independent engineering firm. Uh, participation. Uh, Act 250 provides a process for participation. Act 248, uh, the PUC has in, been effect, has been in effect rubber stamping hundreds and hundreds of these things. Not only that, they've converted all the records into a database which is not usable by the general public. And if you are able to mine some records out of it, I got a list from the PUC of all the 240A projects that had been permitted. And each one of them would necessitate <laughs> downloading 20, 30, 40 documents, all with a gibberish file name. So the access to documents to even review and participate in these uh, antenna reviews is, has been greatly impeded by the implementation of EPUC. That's another topic that this committee needs to take up. Um, I've been uh, raising it for several years now, and you still haven't had time to address it. Uh, our statute now, 202C, 30 BSA 202C, requires two, uh, two of its goals and policy statement are open access and competitive choice. Uh, unless we're going to cite towers and make neutral host a imperative in these <laughs> permit reviews so that all carriers are <coughs> represented within a small cell or a tower we are in effect impeding the goal of competitive choice and open access we're a tourist based economy in in many ways and it's not okay to have to have a, a, a different cell phone or three different cell phones in order to have coverage as you travel Vermont. The neutral host model, uh, which we experimented, unfortunately, uh, an ill-prepared experiment with Coverage Co. is what we should be pursuing. Same with co-location, shared infrastructure. We shouldn't be building double towers, and yet you look up on Irish Hill here in Montpelier, and there's two full towers up per minute. That was not supposed to happen. That is an example of the PUC rubber stamping these things without adequate review. In some cases, they tear down another tower after the, if they have to build a stronger one. Uh, they force everybody to move over to the stronger tower.
but to have two permanent towers there should not have happened under current law. The Natural Resources Board is currently required by statute, and I can't remember the exact statute, to maintain an inventory of wireless infrastructure. Unfortunately, when all these, when AT&T started working exclusively with 248A, that obligation fell apart. The Natural Resources Board does not get the information because they're not filing under 250, and the PUC uh, does not take on the obligation of maintaining an inventory. So the other initiative that's going on that relates to this is the resiliency, the power outage and resiliency planning that is now finally getting underway many years later. And we should be looking at whether or not we're going to condition these antennas on adequate battery backup, reviewing the propagation coverage from these antennas, because that's not going on right now. The, the propagation is essential for emergency planning, for filling in dead zones by, with municipally owned cells. And absent that kind of more thorough review, which the PUC is uh, self-described as very overworked with a lot of other projects, I think it's appropriate to allow these types of permits to go back to Act 250. I'm not uh, confident that I'm going to prevail on that argument, but uh, so generators in diverse routes should be part of these reviews. That's not happening now. Uh, that's again part of the resiliency planning that should be. So I'm asking you do not remove the sunset. Extend it one more time if you must. Uh, if you're not willing to just let these let it expire and let these permits go back to Act 250, but then give clear guidance on integration of the resiliency planning, the local prerogative of siting, uh, the propagation analysis from these towers so that we actually start to build enough information and see how the 10-year telecom plan once adopted uh, it, it can be argued, and it was Senator Shumlin's bill in 1995 to implement the findings of the Joint Legislative Committee on the Telecom Plan that recommended that all CPGs be required to be consistent with the Telecom Plan, okay? And if you're going to finally have a real Telecom Plan, it would be appropriate to consider making every one of these CPGs for towers consistent with that Telecom Plan. That would address the open access, the resiliency, the backup, the diverse routes, et cetera. So I know I threw a lot of technical stuff at you, but I can't do much in five minutes. Okay. Quick question. Do you propose models? Uh, any examples? Europe. Most well, of Europe. Okay, and so on. I'm in the US. Uh, I have not researched. Uh, I, I have seen that's why I asked. No, but in, in rural areas, it's the only cost-effective way. It's, it's absolutely wasteful to have three different carriers trying to build three sets of towers. And uh, often AT&T is building these towers and then not even retaining them. Uh, they're selling the tower off to a tower so that there's no incentive to create a neutral host model or to co even co-locate the other carriers. So it's not cost-effective to pursue other than neutral host for these rural areas. And I have asked the AT&T president to run it up the chain and see if they would participate as they finally did in coverage code mm -hmm. as a result of the first net contract, uh, if they would participate in a neutral host model of small cells around Vermont. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are now going on to S193 <coughs> and less committee. I have this on for possible vote. Is anyone ready to vote? Do you want to let this sink for Can a minute? I make five, ten seconds on that topic since I was just on wrapping up? What, yeah, I noticed on it. What, the, on which topic? The new bill, 193. No, not at this moment. We're still deciding if we're going, what we're doing with the old bill. We're, we haven't taken that one up yet. So on 301 committee, do you want to let that? I look to Senator Brock. He's the lead sponsor. He's guru? comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with it. Yeah. I, you know, I was a little bit, as you know, Madam okay. Chair, uncertain, yep. but I'm feeling 
fine. I don't see in your worst case scenario something okay. could always be put back in. Right. Again, if we have a telecom plan uh, and the telecom planning is done in accordance with with with, yeah. with our the bill we passed last year, if there need to be changes in 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 two forty eight, um, then I think that's the appropriate time to make them. But for now, let's not continue on with the process that we've done four times and. Uh, yeah, yeah it takes a lot of time and resources. Except we're not, we're not, by putting another sunset, we're not going to do any. Well, we're forcing us to come back and do it again. Exactly. That's the point. That's the pressure. And it's that not I'm, necessary to well, do it again. I, I, I see that being the pressure to do this kind of review after 17 years, where maybe some tweaks. I, I would be fine. I don't know if it's appropriate handing it over to the Public Utility Commission to write us a report about the recommendations of any changes. I just want there to be some pressure on to see if we can make the I process think that's better. What the telecom plan is, in my mind, that's, that's part of the telecom plan. And so when we get the independent review with the outline of what we should do for a, uh, a, a long-term telecom plan, then that's the place for us to act on on this and all oh, the other things we, that relate to it. Are we sure the telecom plan will get that granular? Well, I'm sure that Mr. Whitaker will, will, will tell the consultants to do that. I, I think we should certainly discuss it with the consultants, and I think they should, yes. Mm -hmm. And I think we could. Because I think it's an integral part of the planning process. I, I think this is the one leverage we have to make sure it gets reviewed. I mean, I, don't, I have no idea whether these are good ideas or bad ideas, but it sounds like this is a hot enough topic, and I'm not talking about 5G whatsoever, uh, to, after so many years, to see if there should be some tweaks. And I think a lot of the people in the room sort of disappear once they don't have the, the necessity to come back into the room to protect their interests. That's, we that's could how I feel. Ask the PUC in this to report back to us if they see the necessity for any changes or updates to these rules. Mm -hmm. I think what we heard is when they sunset every couple of years, you kind of, you know, you kind of just that would be fine. let it roll. That, that would be fine. Be fine. fine. Okay, yeah. so Your drafter is okay. my drafter is not here or is here? Is not here. He is not, not here. Okay. We will ask Alan to um, draft that, and then I'll get it up for a vote next week. Do they? Or Friday. Well, just, just on the process of the PUC. I, mean, I don't know whether there would. I know that there's methodology where they open a docket. I don't know if it needs to be that formal. But will they reach out to consumers as well as interested stakeholders in, in asking for input on any changes to 248? If you require us to do so. Yeah. Okay, well, make sure that's there. Well, that's not our drafter. No, I was talking to. That's not, not, she's not our drafter. Mm -hmm. Not on that issue. Okay. Not on that issue. Happy right. to Ellen is tied up with Act 250. Okay, okay. okay. Um, but we will ask the PUC to report back to us on any changes they feel are necessary after holding a public hearing with stakeholders or well, talking, is that no? Yeah. A workshop, or something a like that. workshop. A yeah, find, help us find the right language. I don't think we need a full no. blown docket investigation, uh, if, but. If you want to have us conduct the workshop process right. and okay. invite stakeholders, that's, right, that's yeah. typical. Okay. Yeah. And, and at, what right. period, at what period of time? Before the next session. Well, the next session? Yeah. yeah. Session, yeah. After the, how about after we have a, a telecom plan? <laughs> okay. Okay. We'll we'll find a date. When do you have a lot of things due, and we'll try not to hit that date. All right. Yes. Uh, on the uh, coverage coast stuff. Is yeah. That, you giving up any leverage on that? Um, I'm not sure that's relevant. Um, the last witness talked yeah. about your, in, in Berkshire where they used to, the plows used to pull yeah. off to yeah. plow the places where you could pull off and use your cell phone on coverage yeah. code. They're not even plowing those places anymore because there's no coverage. There's no, there's no coverage. The town is it's been a step backwards. I wonder if 
I think we might want to ask the department because my understanding is they worked very closely with towns trying to get towns to take over the small cells and they got no takers and I think that's really kind of a report from the department not part of this. Well, you know sometimes you just got to shoot a dead horse. Added to that report is what do we do with those things? We got you know, yeah. to so well yeah, no. <laughs> Don't just beat the dead horse. Shoot it. So I can't get there. I mean, it, I'm trying to get you out of here before 8 o'clock, and if we don't get through this agenda, we're not going right. to get out of here. Well, I'm with, I'm with Sir right. here. I think adding that language at the end would be great. Yeah, okay. Is there a so, user Yeah. We will ask Ellen. I just have a Maria, you just need to shoot the dead horse. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, deep breath. We are going on to another exciting. This is the penalties uh, for violation of the E911 outage reporting rules. And I think where we went with this is we wanted the report to come in so that we knew how much of a problem there was with people not being able to reach emergency services. It seems like there is a reporting standard nationally. I believe she's done. I think she hung up. Yeah. Uh, um, that sounds huge to us and goes through a formula. And if the companies reveal that number, they're revealing proprietary things, probably market share. Um, and we're trying to find out. <coughs> I'm starting to say, so what do we do with it once we find it out? Um, because the only solution is to build redundancy, and that gets expensive. Uh, but in, Senator, is this still tied up in rules? Or is this I'm sorry, is I was looking for the message the, on auctions. The 911. Do your homework at home. <laughs> The 911 rule is that still sitting there waiting? It has been postponed. It's been postponed. Is the reason it's been postponed is we have not? We didn't get to it. Okay, it's because oh, we, we had planned to postpone to it. for a, a reason, but we didn't, <laughs> we didn't get to it to that for the reason. Right. So we postponed. So that wasn't it. we weren't. It wasn't my fault <laughs> that you had trouble this morning. Um, so, Madam Chair, Matt, this just yes. increases the penalty uh, e, uh, S-193 itself? No, it requires reporting or there is a penalty. Your Do we have a lawyer? Maria. Yes. yes. Come on up. We have the final proposed rule. It was not in the room. All right. No um, Maria yeah. Rona, the Legislative Council. So uh, last year you authorized the E-914 to develop a, uh, a rule uh, with reporting requirements uh, specific to electric companies, the VoIP providers and the wire right. providers. Right. I think Bar Meal walked your rule. That's the rule that's presently before LCAR or will be next week. S-193, um, just specifies that uh, an administrative penalty for violations of that rule when it becomes effective. Okay. It doesn't change the substance of it. It just recognizes that there will be a rule at some point. And it doesn't matter if we were to pass this before the rule is out of our car. It's just when the rule goes into effect. Correct. Okay. Well, well, do we need this if the rule says the same thing? Could that be done in our car? You don't. You could add, I don't believe there is a penalty in the rule now. Oh. So if you wanted to add or require that the rules I mean, that would include be a penalty. So how did we get, we spent a lot of time in here on when, because it, it seemed like, you know, you could just make a simple phone call and say, we're down in Townsend. But then it started to get, no, there's FCC 
you know, it, it's not like there's a local office that can call the 911 board or does, and there's FCC regulations as to when you have to report an outage. How did, how do we get bogged down in that? Well, there are FCC regulations, reporting requirements, and they have thresholds about when you're required to report to the, an right. outage to the FCC, and that information is confidential. Um, I think what you were trying to get at is should we have reporting protocols at the state level? Yes. And you already have them for the landline providers, the legacy phone companies, but this was to have additional out of reporting requirements that would apply to the wireless providers and the VoIP and this was providers. Mm -hmm. There were something like 9,000 and we were at 10, right? The rule calls for if 10 people, if 10 phones are down for more than, am I remembering three hours I correctly? I've heard of Barb Neal, I don't okay. specifically, and she'll tell specifically. And that, specifically is that correct? Me. No, the, the, the final proposal, which is with Elkhart, okay. is 25 subscribers, a telephone service provider with 25 subscribers out of service unable to reach 911 for right. 30 minutes or more. Okay. And then for wireless, it, it talks about uh, normally covered geographic areas, so that's, we're referencing okay. the towers. But we were much lower in numbers, and I believe some of the testimony was they don't know, um, and did they have to go through this because of the limited time if they just have to go up in change a battery or restart a generator. And I asked the providers to see if they could come back with something they could do. I understand the proprietary issues, but is there something between 25 and 9,000 that, that would give us the information that we're seeking, which is to know, but at this point, we're seeking the information without a viable solution. I mean, if they're out, they're out. We don't, <coughs> other than calling up and telling the local fire department, mm -hmm. you might be aware that some of your people aren't getting cell service. Mm -hmm. they, else. Yeah, I mean. Well, the issue we had last year was that we did not have a clear picture of just how big a problem we had right. and where the problem was. We knew about the telephone isolation issue with the legacy carriers, but as far as the other carriers, we didn't know. We then ran into the situation in Shrewsbury, for example, right. where they were out for two or three weeks because of a battery problem. So that caused us to ask, well, where else are we having a problem? And that's when we added this right. to the bill that we passed last year. Now, that went through several iterations at the end because we were running into things like uh, uh, a smaller uh, you know, wire carrier was saying, well, you know, we can't give you a report within two hours because we don't have anybody in the office. We have a lineman on the line, uh, and, and that's about yeah. it. So we, we, we made a change to, well, is this or as soon as reasonably possible? Now we have uh, some folks coming to us saying, you know, like the Comcast saying, well, you know, as we talk about battery backup where a battery is down, we may have an issue that the battery is not a battery like in Shrewsbury that covers, you know, a number of lines. The battery may be in a subscriber's home. And did we intend to include that? I would argue that we did not intend to include that. And so that is another thing that we may need to do a fix for that. And with that in mind, uh, we also had various discussions with some of the larger carriers, Verizon and AT&T, about because part of our goal was to see whether or not we could accomplish reporting from those carriers based on reports that they already submitted to the FCC rather than require and creating some additional regimen. And that's where I gathered in the discussions with the E911 board, uh, we ran into some, some difficulty because the reporting that they do is at such a high level, it didn't have sufficient granularity to inform us. And that's why we're perhaps back here talking about it again. We are. And there is a rule about to go through or not go through. I don't know what they're going to do. I did get that little package that asked me to say if it meets legislative intent or not. And at this point, I'm not sure. Um, 
Yes. We were, we believe that the rule that was being promulgated had, is before us, but that the requirement that the 9-1 board meet before sending us the rule or, or having some sort of discussion, and perhaps we could ask why the 9-1 board met this morning was in, okay. in an effort. Did you meet this morning? We did not. I thought we did. No. Um, then I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, this I, can, I can speak First to that. Okay, well, yeah. I've got one witness. So I'm going to take the one witness. And then um, I think I'm, I'm, I was hoping maybe the industry and 911 could get together and find wording that worked because it's very dangerous if we try and do that. Is, is there a provision in the current law that says that the 911 board will um, adopt rules that have uh, that, that have reasonable fines and sanctions for failure to to carry out their, the is, for pe for people to fail to report or no no okay. there is not in the, in the proposed rule there is not a uh, penalty um, our remedy is to take a, a Whoever to Washington Superior Court to enforce. Is that was that your question? Well, it's in the so you would have to go to court. Does the yeah. does the current law direct you to come up with a rule that has a penalty or a fine? Yeah, I don't believe so. No. Does it give you the authority to do it? I believe. Yeah, I think we have the authority to create penalties. So I, <coughs> I have to double check on that. Madam Chair. Sure. Can I, do, can I do my one witness and then we okay. get, that we're getting into committee discussion. So, Jeff Austin, come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam for the time. Uh, for the record, Jeff Austin from Consolidated Communications. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, S-193. Just from a provider standpoint, that actually has been reporting 911 outages that affect 911 service for decades you know, at this point. So everything that we're talking about related to that rule, Consolidated and its predecessor companies have been doing this you know, you know, for about 20 years now. But as, um, so as it currently stands, we report to 911 anytime we have 25 or more customers affected by an outage. Um, and so they don't have access to 911. So we do that through a reporting through our network operations center. So it's a pretty, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. So it's a pretty standard process for us. I'm just looking at this penalty part of it. You know, the we have really good, and so do the other carriers, open communication with the 911 board, obviously. But invoking a penalty as we're actually trying to revamp the rule um, seems to just be a little bit premature putting a, a penalty in there. Because one of the things that we see is based on the 2019 data for 911 origination. 70% of 911 calls in Vermont in 2019 originated on a wireless carrier's network. 10% originated on a voice over IP carrier network. And then 20% originated on the, the ILACs, you know, the, the, the landline services. Out of that 20%, about 12% came over consolidated you know, network. So as we were kind of talking, I know you were talking about the rule a little bit. Um, and just trying to figure out the right ways of putting the right um, requirements, you know, and the right um, levels of outage, you know, affecting customers together. Uh, I just thought it was helpful to just kind of review that information. And again, just on the penalty, as we're trying to figure out the best way to incorporate that, um, you know, putting a penalty against that, you just, especially with new carriers coming into this, the wireless and the voice over IP carriers would have these new reporting requirements might be difficult, especially as they kind of get into this and, and work through that process. So, you know, certainly one of the things that, you know, we support is going through that, um, the E911 outage reporting rule, you know, based on the fact that, you know, the wireless carriers are originating 70%. It does make sense, obviously, to incorporate those carriers into this new rule process. Mm -hmm. um, how to do that exactly, what those numbers are, might be, you know, still kind of a question mark. That 25, just so you know, everybody, you know, this might be helpful. That 25 number that we've always been working with, you know, for the last couple of decades, I believe that came from our smallest copper distribution cable in our entire network is a 25 pair cable. So you could have 25 customers on a 25 pair cable. So if that gets cut, we would have the requirement to. But you, but you know. Yes. So that's one of the things. So I think the question about where that 25 came from. 
And is that applicable? You know, as we we're talking about mm -hmm. wireless carriers, voice over IP carriers. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe it's a good place to start. Um, and it gives us something to work with. Um, so ultimately, the end result will just be much better and you know much more actionable and and really meaningful reporting to the 911 board from all the companies. Then you really get a good big picture. Right now, the reporting we do is good for the 911 board to know so they can notify the local fire department, as you guys mentioned. But it doesn't really draw a really good picture of uh, the potential issues that we may have around the state. But if my landline's down, I've got a cell phone and it's up, we're fine, but more and more people just have a cell or they have VoIP and I don't think a lot of people, especially some of us that are pre-tech age, understand that that's not the same as your landline and that it can be down without your electricity, you know, or it can go down when your electricity's going out even though normally a landline would have had phone or you might get a, a signal and still not be able to get 911. So, but I am not sure, just listening, that this is ready for prime time. I, I don't know. Uh, yes. And maybe I will get that up for this. Maybe we'll do that next. We're going to get, I think, 318 out, but we haven't voted yet. Senator. Uh, so, in reading this, I feel very uncomfortable imposing a penalty by law on a rule that I haven't seen. Yeah. You have the rule in your folder. It's not adopted yet. No, right. it is not, not adopted. You this is change, the pro not rule. Pass. I'm going to impose uh, the penalty. It also says the $25,000 penalty applies to outage reporting protocols. That could be, I think we're after the number, mm -hmm. but there could be all other kinds of protocols there that could be fairly minor, that we don't know whether $25,000 is the right fit. Right. It doesn't seem to give a choice of up to $25,000. I, I would move to table this group. But Sorry. we have a rule that is before. So that word uh, this rule has yeah. been postponed by Elcott. Right. I think we could ask that this <coughs> section be struck and that a 911 and the utilities work with us. Other than that, I think I'm going to have to <coughs> check the little box that says we're not sure it's in compliance with legislative intent because we're not sure what our intent is. I think we know what our intent is, but we're trying to figure out how to get it. And I don't, I think the technologies are different for wireless, they're right. They've got a cell phone tower down, but they don't know how many people are out because I could be pinging off of three towers. Right, but it, the, yeah. your, the, the request of you to check off a box, does it have anything to do with the statute? It has to do with whether or not the rule is complies with legislative but intent. But so this has nothing, but or is arbitrary. But this particular statute just imposes a penalty. Whether we do anything with this has no relationship well, to whether you check that rule, box or not. Does the rule have, it does not have a penalty in it. I don't believe there are any penalties in the proposed rule. That is correct. There is no penalty in the is proposed the, rule. Is the reporting requirements, the number, it's at the 25? Yes. The thresholds. But for the record, I'm our real executive director yeah. of the 911 board. I'll finally say that the thresholds that we propose uh, in that rule are defined in the rule. So it's 25 subscribers for 30 minutes or more. And I would add that we, uh, the reason we went to those thresholds, which are astronomically lower than the FCC thresholds yes. for wireless and void, yeah. um, was to level the playing field in a sense so that the data that we are collecting about any kind of telephone outage right. is more apples to apples than apples to something entirely different. Comic blocks, yes. That's the way that we saw we would be able to meet the requirements of Section 25, which was to provide an assessment of the impact of these various types of outages, including electric power outages on access to 911. So 
the reason the thresholds are listed that way in the proposed rule are so we can meet that require that assessment, the requirements of that assessment. All right. <coughs> I think we probably yeah. Until we get this worked out, I don't think we need to put penalties in. I would hope because I was hoping that the utilities could come back, the providers could come back to us with a number that would work. I understand that for, uh, cable probably knows if their cable line is down. Maybe. I can understand that wireless may not know how many people are out because there could be numerous cell towers and because one's down. But it seems like if you've got a tower down, you've probably got 25 people in danger of not getting service. If, if I could add yeah. a little bit more. So, so the FCC has calculations in place that actually the wireless carriers could better explain for how they determine how many users are on a tower at any given moment. And it's kind of a nationwide yeah. number. That number is proprietary to each company. My conversations with those wireless companies um, lead me to believe that assuming 1,000 users per wireless tower is, is reasonable. And so that means for if we kept the FCC thresholds, we would not know when a wireless tower was down for 15 hours. That's before we're, we would. That's when we would get to the 900,000 user minute threshold. Okay, but so if a tower is, I'm struggling with <clears throat> what they have in, for infrastructure is towers. So I'm not seeing how 25, unless you know, a tenth of a tower went down. They, that's. A thousand may be as granular as they can get. So there are in the proposed rule there are outage reporting thresholds for wireline and for uh, for line power for the traditional wireline okay. um, telephone service and for the non-line power telephone service and for wireless and they're all defined a bit differently in the rule or at least the wireless is defined a bit differently. Okay. So that's where this 25 people, 25 subscribers for 30 minutes, that applies really to the wire lines and to the um, non-line powered fixed yeah. phones, your VoIP phones. The way we describe an outage in the rule for wireless is a bit different because the technology is different. Okay. Excuse me. So that's why we're... Okay. All right. So I think... We, at this point, are not going to do a penalty. Okay, Mr. Storo, any questions for Mr. Austin? Okay.